Good evening, everybody. It's great to be here. Good to see everybody here this evening. Now, I want you to know what would you think of somebody that gave you a 12-point lesson and only gave you 35 minutes to give it in? I'll tell you what. I don't know what to think about that. But a study of the minor prophets is going to enrich the life of anyone that explores the treasures that is found in each one of those small books. These men come from, come from different walks of life. And God used them to prophesy to several different nations as well. They wrote during, excuse me, during times of spiritual and moral decay. They were sent to Israel. They were sent to Judah. They were sent to heathen nations. But God wanted to show that He cares for everyone and He wanted to bring them back to Him. You will see in these books the thunder of God's wrath. You'll see in these books the tender love and care that God has for His people. Your life is going to be greatly enriched and my life will be greatly enriched as we study the minor prophets. What I want to do is I want to give just a brief explanation of each book as we go through this. So you can turn to the minor prophets starting in Hosea. The date of Hosea's writing is found in Hosea chapter 1, verse 1. It says, The word of the Lord that came unto Hosea, the son of Beeri, in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, the king of Israel. This would be the second Jeroboam, not the first Jeroboam. So in other words, Hosea is dated somewhere around 750 to 725 B.C. This letter was written to the northern ten tribes of Israel over which Jeroboam II at that time reigned. Hosea's name means salvation. His occupation and home are really not known, but his message shows the great tender heart of God. There is sadness and doom in some of the pages of the letter of Hosea, but there is also hope and sweetness rippling through the pages there. An example of doom, Hosea chapter 4, verse 6. Hosea 4, 6. My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee, that thou shalt be no priest to me. Seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, I will also forget thy children. That shows how serious that it is. God is serious. He goes, I'm going to reject you. Yes, I'm going to forget your children as well. But there is also that sweetness of God. Hosea chapter 6, verses 1 through 3. Hosea 6, 1 to 3. <clears throat> Come, let us return unto the Lord, for He hath torn and He will heal us. He has smitten and He will bind us up. After two days will He revive us and the third day He will raise us up. And we shall live in His sight. Then shall we know if we follow on to know the Lord, His going forth is prepared as the morning. And He shall come unto us as the rain, as the latter rain and the former rain unto the earth. And again, I get to step on everybody's lesson. But I'm just going to give a brief synopsis of each one. Now let's go to the book of Joel. The date for Joel's writing is given as an estimate. It varies anywhere from 830 B.C. to 750 B.C. Joel was a prophet for Judah. Joel's name means Jehovah is God. His message shows the doom of the nations and God's plea for the nation to repent. Look at Joel 2, 12, and 13. Joel 2, 12, and 13. Therefore also now saith the Lord, turn ye to me with all your heart, and with fasting, and with weeping, and with mourning, and rend your heart, and not your garments. And turn unto the Lord your God, for He is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and repenteth him or relent, or relents of the evil. Joel is also the prophet of Pentecost. There in Joel chapter 2, verses 28 to 32. 
Joel 2, 28-32 And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out My Spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out My Spirit. And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned in the darkness and the moon in the blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance. <clears throat> As the Lord has said, and in the remnant of whom the Lord shall call. You can go to Acts 2, 16-21 and see those words over in Peter's sermon. The book of Amos, the date of the writing of the book of Amos is again found in Amos chapter 1, verse 1. It says the words of Amos who was among the herdmen of Tekoa, which he saw concerning Israel in the days of Uzziah king of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam the son of Joash king of Israel, two years before the earthquake. This is the same Jeroboam, the second Jeroboam there that was a leader over the ten northern tribes. So it's dated somewhere from 765 to 750 B.C. The letter was written to the northern ten tribes of Israel during the days of Jeroboam the second, but also to the nations that bordered Israel and Judah at that time. Amos' name means burdensome. His message was this, imminent disaster for sin, but there would be a faithful remnant. Samaria, the capital city of Israel, would be destroyed because of the wickedness of that people. And I want to look at some of the sins that Samaria would be destroyed for. First of all, Amos 4.1, they oppressed the poor. Amos 4.1, and this verse is actually written or spoken to the women of Samaria. It says, Hear ye this word, ye kind of Bashan that are in the mountains of Samaria, which oppress the poor, which crush the needy, and say to their masters, Bring and let us drink. They want it more. Just crush them more and bring us more. Secondly, Amos chapter 6, verse 1, they were at ease with their evil lifestyles. We're going to read just a few verses here. Verse 1, Woe to them that are at ease in Zion and trust in the mountain of Samaria, which are named chief of the nations to whom the house of Israel came. Verse 4 says that lie upon beds of ivory, and stretch themselves upon their couches and eat the lambs out of the flock and the calves out of the midst of the stall. Verse 5, that chant, the American Standard Version says, sing idle songs to the sound of the viol and invent themselves instruments of music like David. And then verse 6, that drink wine in bowls and anoint themselves in the chief ointments. But they are not grieved for the affliction of Joseph. So they were ease with their evil lifestyles. They were also greedy. Chapter 8, verses 4 and 5. Chapter 8, verses 4 and 5. It says, Hear ye this, ye that swallow up the needy, to make the poor of the land to fail, saying, When will the new moon be gone, that I may sell corn, or we may sell corn? And the Sabbath, that we may set forth wheat, making the ephah small and the shackle great and falsifying the balances by deceit. They had light balances and they were weighing less than what they said they were selling and they were gaining more money. They were a greedy people. But there would be a faithful remnant. Chapter 9 here of Amos verses 14 and 15. Verses 14 and 15. And I will bring again the captivity of my people Israel. And they shall build the way cities and inhabit them, and they shall plant vineyards and drink the wine thereof. They shall also make gardens and eat the fruit of them. And I will plant them upon their land, and they shall no more be pulled out of their land, <clears throat> which I have given them, saith the Lord thy God. Then we come to the book of Obadiah. And I won't do a lot about that. You'll hear about it in a little bit. 
Obadiah, the date of his writing was probably 586 B.C. when the Edomites were rejoicing at the destruction of Jerusalem by the Babylonian army. You might recall the Edomites were descendants of Esau and there just seemed like there was always enmity between Israel and Edom for centuries. Obadiah's name means the servant of Jehovah. His message was twofold. First, the destruction of the nation of Edom. Verse 4. He said, Though thou exalt thyself as an eagle, though thou set thy nest among the stars, thence will I bring thee down, saith the Lord. And then the second part, the exaltation of Zion when Edom is cast down. And that is Obadiah verses 17 and 18 says, But upon Mount Zion shall be deliverance, and there shall be holiness. And the house of Jacob shall possess their possessions. And the house of Jacob shall be a fire, and the house of Joseph a flame, and the house of Esau for stubble. And they shall kindle in them and devour them, and there shall not be any remaining of the house of Esau, for the Lord has spoken it. When we come to the book of Jonah, the date of Jonah's writing is between 780 and 740 B.C. during again the reign of Jeroboam II. I want to go back now. Keep your marker here, but go with me to 2 Kings chapter 14. We're going to read verses 23 through 25. 2 Kings 14, 23 through 25. It says, In the fifteenth year of Amaziah, the son of Joash, king of Judah, Jeroboam, the son of Joash, <clears throat> king of Israel, began to reign in Samaria and reigned forty and one years. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. He departed not from all the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin. Verse 25 says, He restored the coast of Israel from the entering of Hamath under the sea of the plain according to the word of the Lord God of Israel. And it says, by which he spake by the hand of his servant Jonah, the son of Amittai, the prophet, which was of gath -hefer. So that tells us whenever Jonah's writing was done. Whenever we look at Jonah, and I'm not going to go through everything about the great fish and all that. You'll learn that. Jonah's name means dove. Well, he's quite a dove, wasn't he? Jonah's message was to all to the Gentiles and Jews alike. And the message is God cares for all nations and God warns them to repent of their sin. Jonah's specific message was to that wicked city of Nineveh there and his message was repent or be destroyed. Jonah chapter 3 verse 4. And Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey, and he cried and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Now remember that the date of Jonah's writing was around 780 to 740, because we'll look at that again in a minute. When we come to the little book of Micah, the date of Micah's writing is given in chapter 1, verse 1 as well. It says, The word of the Lord that came to Micah, the Morishite, in the days of Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, which he saw concerning Samaria and Jerusalem. So Micah's date would be from about 740 to 700 B.C. Micah would have been contemporary with Isaiah, and he would have witnessed the fall of the northern kingdom of Israel. Micah's name means who is like Jehovah. Idolatry was rampant in Judah during the reign of evil king Ahaz. And I want to go back to the book of 2 Kings now and look at chapter 16, verses 2 through 4. 2 Kings 16, 2 through 4. It says, 20 years old was Ahaz when he began to reign and reigned 16 years in Jerusalem and did not that which was right in the sight of the Lord his God like David his father. But he walked in the ways of the kings of Israel, yea, and made his son to pass through the fire. In other words, he sacrificed one of his sons to a false god. 
continues to say, according to the abominations of the heathen whom the Lord God cast out from before the children of Israel, and then verse 4, and he sacrificed and burnt incense in high places and on the hills and under every green tree. So they needed the word from God and Micah delivered that word. Micah's teachings would have also greatly influenced the works there of good King Hezekiah there in Judah. Micah's message was both to Samaria and Jerusalem. His message was one of doom for the nations, but also one of hope. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm getting kind of stopped up here. For the future Messiah and his coming kingdom. First of all, look at Micah 1 9. This would be talking about the doom. It says, For her wound is incurable, for it has come unto Judah, he has come unto the gate of my people, even to Jerusalem. They were going to be conquered. But then we also look at Micah chapter 5, verse 2, and we see the promise of the coming Messiah. He said, But thou Bethlehem Ephrathah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall come forth unto me that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth are from old and from everlasting. Of course, Bethlehem being the birthplace of Jesus Christ our Savior. So he spoke of that. We come to the book of Nahum. The book of Nahum was probably written between 630 and 610 B.C. Nahum would have been contemporary with Jeremiah then. Nahum's name, mean, name means comforter, but there is little comfort in his message. Nahum's message was the fall and destruction of Nineveh. You might recall that whenever Jonah came to the city of Nineveh between 780 and 740 B.C., they repented at that time, but now we're looking around 630 to 610 B.C., the city was filled with blood. It was filled with evil. Nahum's message was the fall and destruction of that city. Nahum 1, 1 and 2. It says, the burden of Nineveh, the book, the vision of Nahum, the El Elkishite, God is jealous, and the Lord revengeth, the Lord revengeth, and is furious. The Lord will take vengeance on His adversaries, and He reserveth wrath for His enemies. And here we know that Nineveh was one of the enemies. It was filled with the blood of the innocents, chapter 3, verse 1. Nahum 3, 1, Woe to the bloody city! It is full of lies and robbery. The prey departeth not. So the city had become wicked, and it would be left desolate. Nahum 2, 13. It says, Behold, I am against thee, saith the Lord of hosts. I will burn her chariots in the smoke. The sword shall devour thy young lions. I will cut off thy prey from the earth. The voice of thy messengers shall be heard no more. Of course, that would be the Babylonian army whenever they came through. When we come to the book of Habakkuk, the date of Habakkuk is given anywhere from 612 to 603 B.C. So it's either just before the destruction of the city of Jerusalem or just after the destruction of the city of Jerusalem there by the Babylonians. That being the case, Hezekiah, I mean Hezekiah, Habakkuk was contemporary with Zephaniah and Jeremiah. They both were alive at that time. Habakkuk's name means embrace. Embrace. Habakkuk's message was one of doom for Judah and then doom for Babylon, but then hope for Judah. So it's threefold message here. Now, this book is written a little bit different from the other books in one way. Instead of speaking God's message to the people, Habakkuk expresses his concerns to God about what is taking place. See, Habakkuk could not understand how God could allow an evil, wicked nation like Babylon to come in and conquer a nation that is not as wicked as Babylon was. He couldn't understand that. We'll look at this just a little bit. 
In Habakkuk 1.6, God says this, For lo, I raise up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation, which shall march through the breadth of the land to possess the dwelling places that are not there. Habakkuk responds in verse 13 there of chapter 1, and he says, Thou art of pure eyes than to behold evil, and canst not look on iniquity. Wherefore lookest thou upon them that deal treacherously, and holdest thy tongue when the wicked devoureth the man that is more righteous than he? He couldn't understand that. And then God replied back to Habakkuk in chapter 2, verses 4 and 8. Verse 4 says, Behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him, but the just shall live by faith. And then verse 8, he's talking about Babylon, Because thou hast spoiled many nations, all the remnant of the people shall spoil thee. Because of men's blood, for the violence of the land, of the city, and of all that dwell therein. So what God is telling Habakkuk is, the wicked will be punished for the evil that they do, but the righteous shall live by faith, as we read. But also the great majesty of God and God or man's proper response to God is seen in Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 20. Habakkuk 2:20. But the Lord is in His holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before Him. That's our proper response to God. When we come to the book of Zephaniah, the date of the writing is given again in verse 1 of the book. Chapter 1, verse 1. The word of the Lord which came unto Zephaniah, the son of Cushai, the son of Gedaliah, the son of Amariah, the son of Hezekiah, in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah. Whenever you look up that word Hezekiah, you look in the American Standard Version, the literal translation, the Young Literal's translation, that's Hezekiah. So Zephaniah had royal blood. He would have been some kind of a cousin to Josiah. And Josiah would have been influenced here by, <coughs> excuse me, by Zephaniah's teaching. So he had some good teachers. Jeremiah would have been one of those as well, again talking there about King Josiah. So the date of his writing is going to be between 630 and 625 B.C. First one again shows that Zephaniah was the great-great-grandson of good King Hezekiah. Josiah was the great-grandson of Hezekiah. Zephaniah's name means Jehovah has hidden. And through Zephaniah, he prophesied in the days of good King Josiah Probably had a great influence on him. But even so, because even though Josiah did great things, that nation would fall because of Josiah's grandfather. He was King Manasseh. Again, keep your marker here. Let's go to Jeremiah 15.4. Jeremiah 15.4. It says there, I will cause them to be removed into all the kingdoms of the earth because of Manasseh, the son of Hezekiah, king of Judah, for all that he did in Jerusalem. And then I want to look at 2 Chronicles 34, verses 27 and 28. 2 Chronicles 34, 27 and 28. This is the response that God gave to good King Josiah after they had found the book of the law and he had read it and read his clothing. It says, Because thine heart was tender and thou didst humble thyself before God when thou heardest his words against this place and against the inhabitants thereof and humblest thyself before me and didst rend thy clothes and weep before me, I have even heard thee also, saith the Lord. Behold, I will gather thee to thy fathers, and thou shalt be gathered to thy grave in peace. Neither shall thine eyes see all the evil that I will bring upon this place and upon the inhabitants of the same. So they brought the king word again, and Zephaniah would have been part of teaching their good king Josiah. The great day of the Lord is mentioned there in Zephaniah chapter 1, verses 14 through 16. And it is a day of God's great wrath. Zephaniah 1, 14 through 16. 
The great day of the Lord is near. It is near. It hasteth, or and hasteth greatly. Even the voice of the day of the Lord. The mighty man shall cry bitterly. That day is a day of wrath, a day of trouble and distress, a day of wastedness and desolation, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness, a day of the trumpet and alarm against the fenced cities, against the high towers. There is talking about the destruction that would be coming upon the nation of Judah. But Zephaniah 2, 3 says those that would obey the Lord would be spared. Zephaniah 2, 3. Seek ye the Lord, all ye meek of the earth, which have wrought His judgment. Seek righteousness, seek meekness. It may be ye shall be hid in the day of the Lord's anger. When we come to the book of Haggai, the date of Haggai is given there in chapter 1, verse 1. It says, In the second year of Darius the king, in the sixth month, in the first day of the month came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet unto Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua or Jeshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest. So Haggai was written in the year 520 B.C. That is when they were to, as a matter of fact, Haggai and his family returned with Zerubbabel from Babylonian captivity in 536 about 16 years earlier. And you may recall that the building of the temple had stopped. Well, Haggai's name means festive. And the message of Haggai is urgency in finishing rebuilding that temple. It had been abandoned 16 years earlier. And the message was to get after it and get it done. Look at Haggai 1, verse 5, and then verses 7 and 8. Haggai 1, 5, or 4, start right there. He says, Is it time for you to dwell, O ye, in your sealed houses, that means panel, and for this house to lie waste? They were living comfortably, but they stopped building the house of the Lord. Verse 5, Now therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Verse 6, You have so much, and you bring in little. You eat, but you have not enough. You drink, but you're not filled with drink. You clothe you, but there is none to warm. And he that earneth wages, earneth wages to put into a bag with holes. In other words, he says, you are not prospering at all. He says in verse 7, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. And then he tells them what to do, verse 8. Go up to the mountain and bring wood and build the house, and I will take pleasure in it, and I will be glorified, saith the Lord. Haggai and Zechariah were contemporaries and they built a spiritual fire under those procrastinating Jews. Go with me to Ezra chapter 5, verse 1. Ezra chapter 5, verse 1. It says there, Then the prophets, Haggai the prophet, and Zechariah the son of Edo, prophesied unto the Jews that were in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of the God of Israel even unto them. Now I want to read verse 2 as well. Then rose up Zerubbabel the son of Shealtiel and Jeshua the son of Josedach and began to build the house of God which is at Jerusalem and with them were the prophets of God helping them. So that's Haggai and Zechariah. They are then contemporaries with Ezra and Nehemiah during this time. So let's look now at Zechariah. The day of Zechariah is about two months after Haggai. I want to go back and read Haggai 1.1. In the second year of King Darius, in the sixth month, first day of the month. Now Zechariah 1.1, in the eighth month, in the second year of Darius came the word of the Lord unto Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, the son of Iddo, the prophet. So it's only about two months later, again in 520 B.C. Zechariah's name means the Lord remembers. His family returned from Babylonian captivity with Zerubbabel as well. 
Zechariah's message? Complete building the temple. You finish that. But he also gave several references to the coming Messiah. First of all, I want to look at Zechariah 1, 3 through 5 concerning rebuilding the temple. Zechariah 1, 3 through 5. Therefore say thou unto them, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Turn ye unto me, saith the Lord of hosts, and I will turn unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. Be not as your fathers, unto whom the former prophets have cried, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Turn ye now from your evil ways and from your evil doings. But they did not hear nor hearken unto me, saith the Lord. So he's telling them, don't be like your fathers. They didn't listen. You need to listen to God. You need to get the temple rebuilt and be obedient. And then one of the references of the coming Messiah, Zechariah 9.9. 9. Zechariah 9.9. 9. It says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy King cometh unto thee. He is just, having salvation, lowly, and riding upon a donkey and upon the foal, or colt of the foal of a donkey. That goes over to Matthew 21, 5, where Jesus fulfilled that. And I believe I said Zechariah here was contemporary with Nehemiah and Ezra. That's not correct. Take that one back. Because Malachi was the one who was contemporary with Ezra and Nehemiah there. Zechariah would have also then been with Ezra there at Shealtiel and all those telling them to rebuild the temple. Now let's go to Malachi. The date of Malachi's writing is probably 445 B.C. to 432 B.C. His name means the messenger of Jehovah. He is the last of the Old Testament prophets. And he was contemporary with Ezra and Nehemiah. He is the one that was there. His message describes a lot of what was happening in the city of Jerusalem during Nehemiah's time. If you want to turn over and read the book of Nehemiah, you'll see what Malachi was dealing with here. His message, basically twofold. There was corruption in worship and corruption in morality. And they needed to change that. Secondly, the Jews did not stand in awe of God's name. And they needed to do that as well. His message is a rebuke to the people for their lack of service for God and their immorality. Malachi is also written in a different style. Malachi kind of comes about as there's a charge made by God. The people respond to the charge made by God and then God rebuts what they just said. And we'll give you some examples of that. Look at Malachi 1, 6 and 7. Malachi 1, 6 and 7. Now this is God speaking. He says, A son honoreth his father, and a servant his master. If I then be a father, where is mine honor? If I then be a master, where is my fear? Saith the Lord of hosts, Unto you, O priest, that despise my name. There's the charge made by God. And then the people respond, And ye say, Wherein have we despised thy name? And then God responds to that. You offer polluted bread upon my altar. And you say, Wherein have we polluted thee? There's the response again of the people. Well, God responds. In that you say, The table of the Lord is contemptible. And how do they show us contemptible? Verse 8. And if you offer the blind for a sacrifice, is it not evil? And if you offer the lame and sick, is it not evil? Offer it now unto thy governor. Will he be pleased with thee? or accept thy person, saith the Lord of hosts. That's the way the book goes. The people respond to a charge of God. And God says, here's why. And then He explains it. <laughs> Malachi gives a strong emphasis on the law of God. Malachi 4, verse 4. He says there, Malachi 4, 4, Remember ye the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded unto him in horror for all Israel with the statutes and the judgments. 
In other words, stop doing what you're doing and start obeying. Start paying attention. And then Malachi closes the book with the promise of one who would prepare the way of the Messiah. Malachi 4, 5, and 6. Malachi chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. Behold, I will send to you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. And you can cross-reference that to Matthew 3, 1 to 3, talking about John the baptizer. You know, the study of the minor prophets, it's going to be filled with a lot of treasures. All I've tried to do this evening is to get your mouth watering to listen to these lessons about the minor prophets. I want to wet your whistle so that you're ready to go. Our lives are going to be enriched as we go through these books and dig out the gems that are contained in these 12 prophets. These books give us information on how God deals with individuals, but also how God deals with nations. In every case, the faithful will be blessed, the unfaithful will be punished. So, let's get ready so that we can study the rest of the minor prophets. Amen. Did I get done in time, Master? About a minute and a half over. Oh, no, no. Oh, oh. I'm telling you, give a man 35 minutes and he takes 36 and a half. <laughs> we appreciate that lesson. Don, as always, did a wonderful job. And, and as he mentioned, uh, really just introduced the books. Would encourage all to be here for each and every lesson, continuing tonight and then, of course, tomorrow night as we go through these various books and we'll go through them in more detail and learn a great deal of information. I did want to mention, I did mention uh, before the lesson, the books, as I've been mentioning, due to some technical issues, we'll say, uh, was not ready, it's not ready, and we've got a list out of the foyer. If you would like a copy, they will be available soon, and we will uh, be glad to get those to you. Um, again, you'll need to just sign up, indicate how many you want, either put your address or perhaps the congregation that you're with, and then we'll be able to get those uh, to you uh, as they are completed. We're going to take a short break uh, and be back at 8 o'clock where Brother David Long will be speaking for Obadiah, and I hope you can get that done in 35 minutes, David. I'm going to push it. <laughs> Can you please do that? Oh, man. <laughs> oh, that was good. good. That was good. It was good, but it was last. Ted, you get somebody here behind you going to sleep. You get somebody here. He may preach your whole He's not here. I cut that pretty short. That's okay. So I got to step on everybody. Yeah. Yeah. I know. <laughs> Yeah, I know it. Like I said, that was my job. <laughs>